I'm Peter Carter, and I'm uh, having the great pleasure to start an interviewing of my dear colleague, uh, Stuart Scott. And um, Stuart and I um, contacted a few years ago, Stuart, I, I think it was over the Lima before, United yeah. Nations uh, Climate Conference. COP20 in 2014. Yeah. 2014, yeah. And um, I recall that I wasn't going to the conferences. I had decided I, I, I wasn't going to do that sort of circus. And I realized that um, there was somebody called Stuart Scott who was attending the conferences on a regular basis. And not only that, but he was recording um, uh, um, messages and uh, interviews, in fact, from these conferences, which were really very impressive. So since then, we've been, um, uh, we've been following each other. I've been following Stuart, and Stuart's been following me, and that, that's, been a, that's been a great experience for the past few years. So thank you. Rich, thank you. So I want to I wanna, um, say about my involvement in the COP and maybe why I stood out, why you found me, is I was the dissident voice at the COP. Because ah. every I, I didn't realize until recently I started calling myself or what I do. Uh, I'm a an investigative video journalist. And and so my participation at the annual climate negotiations, which are called COP, Conference of Parties, COP, um, was in kind of pulling the curtains off of what was really going on, mm -hmm. which was a very elaborate show with mm -hmm. very little being accomplished. And so that became my, my, the key to my notability, is that I was telling it like it was, not like the UN wanted the rest of the media to report it, which was everything's fine, we're gonna, we're gonna make our target, you know, we just have to mm, a little harder, whatever mm, is. Yes, it was that aspect of, um, of your recordings that I picked up on. It was a, a very different uh, quality and content. Yeah. Thanks. Like I come from Brooklyn. I tell the truth. You don't like it. Lump it. You know. <laughs> you talked about carbon budget. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of bullshit going on out there that we still have a carbon budget. Not. We have already spent our carbon budget. But the politicians have this they have this routine down of kicking the can down the road, and they do that by this notion of a carbon budget. We have no more carbon budget. I want to dispense with that illusion. We are borrowing from future generations at this point. We are making their lives much more difficult. Our partnership is very close because we recognize that we are a couple of the relatively few people in the world who actually do tell the truth about climate change. I've been calling it the terrible truth for some years. And, um, uh, and those of us who are prepared to tell the terrible truth, we do become very, very close because we have a common mission and a common sense of what to do with our life. Now, I was brought up in England, as you can tell, and one of the most popular television shows in England actually was called This Is Your Life. Yeah. And uh, we would, um, and they were really great because we would learn about people who weren't sort of national figures or national names who deserved um, to have their, their life recorded. And if there's anyone that I know that deserves to have his life recorded, um, it, is, it is you, Stuart. So let us take a look at your life in your own words and what has influenced you, you know, in bringing you to where you are today. Oh, Peter, thank you so much. I, um, my involvement in the climate arena, I decided early on, or it was my guidance, my inspiration, that, that I would step out of the limelight and I would bring others into the limelight. So I became, and, and then I realized over the years that I, that I had a story to tell about myself too, but it was kind of too egotistical to, uh, to get out there and try to tell it. Mm -hmm. and, um, but it's kind of, I guess, as I'm, getting close to the end. Right. It's time for me to uh, 
put the story down that's worth telling, not because it'll make me famous, but because it may provide some inspiration to others. This, this is why I really, really wanted to interview you, Stu. So, yes, it's a tough thing for you to talk about, but please go on as to, um, you know, even, even your early childhood experiences and things like some, that. Some of those early childhood things were, were extremely seminal in, in my outlook and in, in how I see the world, obviously. So I was in the Boy Scouts. Um, mm -hmm. I loved my, my time in nature when I'd have to come back home. It was like I got very depressed and my parents would have to talk me through it. And they'd say, oh, yeah, after being out in nature, coming and being seeing four walls is difficult yeah. to understand, you know. Um, so I was a, a, a nature boy who was born in the city by mistake. <laughs> and, Interesting. Um, and then a after that, um, I think probably one of the things which I have to mention along the way is that when I was, um, I'm trying to remember how, how old, I think when I was 14 years old, I was mm -hmm. a stage magician. Oh. Yeah. Um, my, my magic, it, my interest in magic and illusion started before that, but I actually was doing stage magic um, when I was 14. And, and what that gave me that has been emblematic in the rest of my life is an understanding of, of human attention and that humans think that they're paying attention when they're not. Right. Um, and so it's pretty easy to create an illusion it's pretty easy to distract people. Yeah. Now, I don't want anybody to think that I've used that in a manipulative way, that I have in any way tried to hide devious lies by understanding how to, <clears throat> but I understood, actually I taught it later on in my, the classes of critical thinking that I taught. I taught how graphic advertising was constructed and how insidious that was, but how they were playing with your attention. So, but I became aware of that kind of thing at a very young age. When, when people ask me about my educational career, I say that the, the most important uh, class I took in my master's program, and it was a master's of science in information science, the most important class I took was one in cognitive psychology. How do we know what we know? Mm, I didn't know this about you. What, const what constitutes the truth? Right. Can you verify, validate that it is the truth? I mean, all of us, even those of us who are scientists, um, and I, I don't call myself a scientist as much as a scientific communicator, I'm well versed in a variety of sciences, I'm, but I've, I, I'm expert at, at communicating for a lay audience difficult concepts. Global civilization has an operating system. I don't know anyone else who teaches this. And when I ask people, what is the operating system? I'll scratch their heads for a moment. And I usually only have to say it's the first thing that came into your mind for them to come up with the answer. It's seriously flawed. It's disastrously flawed. And it's known by two names. Money and economics. You must have had a great insight as well as frustration into the climate change denial campaign then, oh. right, Stuart? Yeah, yeah. And, and basically, you know, I, I class that if you say a lie enough times and people will believe it as a truth. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and it still goes on. It's, and it does. Yeah. The next seminal thing that I will mention in my history into what I am now was that I was present in 1968 at what was called the Columbia Uprising. Ah. Uh, this was when the students took over the campus they barricaded themselves into several buildings, including the president's office. They went through the president's files. They saw the smoking gun letters by which Columbia was 
uh, complicit in war research. Um, and they needed a way to get these out, like WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks didn't exist. Yeah. Well, yeah. so, okay, I had been very straight laced student. I got into college early. I was I went to Columbia on weekends when I was 16, uh, 15 and 16. And I actually entered Columbia as an undergrad when I was 16. So I was an wow. innocent kid. Talk about- You were a bright kid. I'm smart, but I was I was innocent, you know, like I was a yeah, yeah. laughing stock of my yeah. friends because yeah. you know, I didn't know anything about girls. <laughs> and, um, but I was the, my job for my, my work study essentially was that I was the monitor for the mathematics building. Um, it's funny, Columbia has a lot of John Jay Hall and this hall. They're all named after people, yeah. either, either uh, patriots or, or donors. Right. Uh, but mathematics was not named after anybody and it was carved into the building. So it still has the distinction of being the one hall that I can think of that's named after the subject. I uh -huh. was the monitor. I knew where everything was in the building. And when the students took over and my roommate, who was a very radical, he was, his parents were, were communists and he was, you know, of that bent also. Okay. He came back and he said, Stuart, you ought to go up there. They just took over the mathematics building. <laughs> I ran up to try to prevent them from breaking windows to get into rooms. Cause you I, did. Yeah. You did. <laughs> Cause I knew what the keys were. Okay. So I ran up there and I showed them, I said, stop guys, stop. And I showed them where the keys were. And guess what? I knew where the key to the Xerox machine was. And so they would smuggle papers out of the president's office over to mathematics, photocopy them, and then put them back in the president's files. So that they could not be accused of, uh, of theft, you know, trespass. And you helped them do that. I helped them do that. His office had one of the first Xerox machines. Copying things and then putting them back. It was not meant to be a looting. We only stopped because we couldn't figure out how to load paper into the Xerox machine. That theme has kind of emerged in my life many times where I've just, by the grace of God, I'll have to say I've been in the right place at the right time, or I perceived an opportunity when nobody else perceived it and made at the right place and time. And, and I've, I've, I've been privileged to do remarkable things because I've had this guidance. Um, uh, uh, plus, know. plus, clearly, you're a very smart but rebellious um, <laughs> uh, expert, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. One, of my, one of my favorite uh, hacks is the, the whole series of programs that I've done at the climate negotiations can be regarded as a hack of the right. system. Because yeah. I realized that their press conference system by which they give any non-governmental organization, any NGO in, right. in uh, jargon, any NGO can get a press conference room at the annual talks once a day for a half hour. Right. And I realized that was an opportunity for me to do a TV talk show. Right. So I just kind of used their talking heads format and tried to make it into something else. Thank you for coming and watching another Scientist's Warning program. I'm your host, Stuart Scott, along with Regina Valdez, and we're coming to you live from Madrid, Spain, COP25, the 25th annual ritual of kicking the can down the road. Here's a, today's guest with us, Dr. William Muma. In 2005, I wrote a paper doing an analysis. It was called The 2% Solution. If beginning in 2005, we had reduced our emissions by 2% a year, by 2050, we would, and assuming that we didn't destroy nature that's sucking up carbon, that we would be, um, we would have stabilized the climate and the temperature at sort of reasonable levels around 350 parts per million or something like that. 
So we've wasted that opportunity. And to add, so I guess, salt in the wound is the term that people use. The World Meteorological Organization just announced, no big surprise, that despite all the things that we say we're doing, carbon dioxide emissions reached a new high, and so did a lot of other gases, methane and other heat trapping gases. So we need to catch up on the years in which we procrastinated. That's a message for the negotiators who are here in Madrid right now. Um, so, but that's a hack. I, and the first time that, that I did it, it was, it was not at the annual COP, the big meeting. It was at what they call an intercessional. And those happen sometimes two, three, four times during the year. A, in Bonn or somewhere, right? Many of them are in Bonn, but when uh -huh. they're important and they want a big attendance, they'll do yeah. it in an exotic place like Bangkok. Uh -huh. And so one of the, the first program I did was on the Interfaith Declaration on Climate Change. Uh -huh. And I did it at a, uh, an intercessional, a small meeting in Bangkok. It was really? Right, yeah. And it was right before the, the COP that they did in Copenhagen. Oh, my gosh. That was COP 15 in 2009. And anyhow, that's when that, that hack of the system started. But I, I've been, you called me a rebel. I've been hacking the system for many, many years, but never in harmful ways. Never in harmful No, 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 no. Always, no, no. always in ways I felt to, to, to forward the general well-being. Yeah, truth and goodness and the best of human beings, right? Yes, truth and, um, and goodness, yes. You, 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 you probably share my frustration at, at, at a recurrent theme that we hear, you know, in um, uh, rationalizing changing the climate and destroying the planet and wiping out, wiping out species. You know, we hear, well, you know, um, uh, it, it's, it's humanity that's doing this. It's human race that's doing this. Um, we're hardwired to do it. We can't help it, you know. Give me your thoughts on that because you and I come across that frequently. S uh, and so, while the end of the world scenario will be rife with unimaginable horrors, we believe that the pre-end period will be filled with unprecedented opportunities for profit. Oh my God, that is so, so bad. It's good, Stuart. Yes, it's, but it's, it's I believe, because Mankoff uh, publishes in the New Yorker magazine. I think it's from the New Yorker magazine. Yes. Yeah. But it's like... it. Somebody sent that to me, and I. It was so. In a nutshell, what the, what we're suffering from, that I I put it on the my signature file in my email. Every email. Oh, okay. I, yeah, I, I can understand that. That's that's really it. We have developed a system for better or worse, which owns us now. Yes. It promotes to the highest levels. You'll recognize this because you helped me say this in. Lima in 2014 with your support, it promotes to the highest levels of power and control and right. wealth the people who are most willing to turn a blind eye to the damage they're doing to the planet, to their yeah. own children. Instead, looking at all of the money, it's the Midas problem. It's, it's the Midas yeah. instinct in us. It's greed. And it's the fact that our system has harnessed greed for its own reproductive purposes. That is, this is a stretch. Money is a thought virus. It has life in that humanity carries the virus of money and shares it and spreads it from one person to the next. Yeah. And, and money promotes to the highest level of control those who are most willing to sacrifice the planet for near-term profits. Right. Well, how can such a system possibly survive? Well, it, 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 it will devour itself. Yes. In the process. Presumably. But, um, you, you know, years ago, Stuart, I, I, I was um, thinking to myself, okay, you know, working with some good environmentalists, really good people, good activists, um, what's going to come first? You know, the, the collapse of the world economy, of the insane, crazy world economy, or the collapse of the planet, you know? 
And I, I thought, perhaps naively, well, it's going to be the world economy. Well, I, I was wrong because they're both going down together, apparently, I guess. Certainly, the planet is, is going down at a rapid pace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and since we don't, we don't know how to make a business model, or we, if we know we're not teaching it in our business schools, we don't encourage business models that remediate the damage we've done, that mitigate mm -hmm. the damage. Mm -hmm. If there's no money to be made in it, how are you going to support such a business? Mm 